<clears throat> this evening we present the, the third in our lecture series about the environment here in beautiful Lake County. It is titled, Reducing Our Carbon Footprint. Our speaker is Dr. Brittany Sellers. She is Assistant Director of Sustainability and Resilience in the City of Orlando's Greenworks Office, where she's advancing and supporting policies and programs designed to meet the city's ambitious sustainability and climate goals. Brittany received her bachelor's degree in psychology from Flagler College. She earned her master's and her PhD in human factors psychology from the University of Central Florida, where her research focused on influencing sustainable behaviors through a combined approach of motivation and design. We are very pleased to have Dr. Sellers here with us tonight. So I'll turn it over to Brittany. Brittany. Thank you so much, Russ, and thank you everyone who provided this wonderful opportunity to share with your congregation tonight a little bit about what we've been doing in the city of Orlando and certainly opportunities to both partner and advance the mission for sustainability as good neighbors to each other. So I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen so you can see my presentation, which should be up in just a moment here. All right, are you able to see my screen? It should read the title of the presentation. Okay, wonderful. Let's go ahead and get started then. So to kick things off, I wanted to go ahead and set some expectations for my presentation and make sure we're all on the same page of what to expect and what I have in store. Um, so first on the left side, the agenda for the content that I'll be sharing throughout my presentation is first providing a brief background on myself, who I am, what I do in the city, and why I'm here speaking with you tonight. A little bit more regarding our program, Greenworks Orlando, or the city's Office of Sustainability and Resilience. And then to help organize the process that I'm laying out regarding how we've approached sustainability um, and how some of this can be modeled and scaled in Lake County and other communities, I go through our strategic process uh, using different programs and policies as various examples from identifying our problems, uh, the solutions in order to address them, committing to goals that can help to fulfill those missions, prioritizing when there are endless strategies available, leading by example, and then of course acting on the entire plan that you've laid out as well as monitoring, reporting, and then starting again with identifying next steps. Um, after that, I'll discuss looking ahead, um, partnerships and next directions, and then of course we'll have time for question and answer and discussion at the end. Um, as was shared earlier, if you have any questions um, that are burning as I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to put it in chat. Um, but for the format of my presentation, I think it'll be most effective if we wait until the end for that discussion. And then in terms of objectives, what my goals are tonight, um, this is just the content that I'm covering, but really what I'd like for you to walk away from this presentation with is a, certainly a little bit more information about the city of Orlando, but hopefully some inspiration regarding local action um, in your own community. Um, and I certainly look forward to the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the great work that you're already doing and helping to advance that further um, and how we can align best in that way as well as a focus specifically on reducing your carbon footprint or carbon reduction goals in general. Our office touches on a lot of work across sustainability, and that can include programs uh, focused on local food, such as community gardens. We have a number of water-related initiatives for keeping our waterways clean, certainly something top of mind in Lake County, as well as Orange County for that matter, um, as well as programs regarding recycling and solid waste. Uh, but given the nature of tonight's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the largest sources of pollution, specifically carbon emissions, and goals and strategies that are designed to meet that specific goal. Um, so know that my presentation is weighted a little more heavily in that area. And certainly if you'd like to learn more about some of those other components of sustainability, which certainly have a measurable, albeit smaller impact, I'd be happy to expand on those either in the future or in a discussion here tonight. 
And as a little fun fact to kick things off, um, I'm actually um, excited to be in such great company for a number of reasons. And one of them is that I'm a neighbor and I've actually been living here in Lake County uh, since just before the pandemic um, in Eustace, specifically near uh, the Loch Laven area. And Hidden Waters is one of my favorite hikes to do in the area. So I'm um, excited to have the opportunity to partner a little bit more um, and start to explore a little bit more as well. With all of that in mind, we can go ahead and get started with the content. So first, as promised, um, who am I? And why is it that I'm here sharing all of this information tonight? How did I get here? I have a little bit more regarding my uh, bit of a garden path background. I did go to Flagler College for my undergraduate in psychology and then completed my master's in root in a PhD program at UCF. And human factors is really an area of psychology that's focused on design. Ergonomics is one component of that and certainly physical design, but really any process or procedure protocol that can be designed to help mitigate um, potential problems, disaster, just make things easier for humans based on our uh, ways of making decisions and the way that we think and perceive and behave in the world um, really can be influenced by human factors. And so for that reason, I thought what more of a human-centered issue is there to try to solve than climate change? Um, and human caused changes that we're seeing and the need to preserve our own species as well as those around us as well, of course. Um, and so I took my field a little bit of a non-traditional way in studying the environment. Um, so hence my title as a human factor psychologist and also a behavioral researcher, really thinking about how design influences the choices that we've made. Um, of course, I'm always happy to go into a completely different conversation about all of this background, um, but in a nutshell, sometimes the easiest example is in a meeting room, if we were all in the same space, pointing to the garbage can next to a recycling bin, and if they're side by side, there's a good chance more people are recycling. If it's even 10 feet further away, we know that many more recyclables are going to end up in the trash. Um, and it certainly gets more complicated across um, use of emerging technology, entire organizations, buildings, and communities. Um, but that's a you know easy way to consider that as a start. Um, and with that work, I completed my doctoral dissertation on studying both um, the elements of design and how that intersects with motivation. So really winding people up with the motivation to want to make a change. Um, whether that's turning up their lights, taking shorter showers, um, or engaging in broader policy related and regulatory behaviors, um, and wove that into some of my work initially working as a consultant with the city of Orlando and policy development, and then a little over four years as a sustainability project manager. Um, and during the time uh, spanning this period, as well as when I was finishing up my degree here, I'm presenting some research at a psychology conference regarding um, some of the feel-good benefits, actually, of participating in sustainable behaviors. And uh, more recently, in the last year, I've been serving as the city's first ever assistant director of sustainability and resilience in the Greenworks office. These are terms we use interchangeably. Uh, Greenworks has a little bit more of a familiar ring to it. And I work alongside an amazing team. We've grown pretty substantially just in the last two years. Uh, most of my time on board with this team over the last six years or so, there was really just a handful of us in this office. And now we're up to about 15 staff members, some of which are part-time, um, but who report directly in our office, as well as many other ancillary partners across the city who are already doing great work in transportation, water conservation, and so on and so forth, who um, help to partner on a number of our initiatives. You may also be familiar with my boss, um, essentially an environmental hero in the area, Chris Castro, um, who's been helping to trailblaze in this space as well, who's our director. And here's a bit of our uh, one of our many logos. Um, if we have any promotional materials, some of this may look familiar. Um, this Greenworks Orlando overview just shows a little snippet of an image and an icon that demonstrate those different areas of sustainability we work in that we'll be touching on. So certainly trees and livability are often the first items that come to mind. Solid waste, recycling, composting, waste diversion, and even food recovery at large transportation, promoting alternative modes, as well as the infrastructure and design necessary to support those changes in behaviors, green buildings, clean water, local food, and clean energy, finally. 
So before we talk a little bit more in detail about those specific strategies and those focus areas, I always think it's helpful to level set a bit and focus on where the city of Orlando's jurisdictional boundaries actually lie, because we have a rather unusual shape and it can certainly very, be very confusing even for residents or those in the area to understand where that lies. Um, in this larger blue area is Orange County itself. Um, with a few of our different landmarks we know. So UCF here over in the corner um, outside of city of Orlando by quite some distance, actually Disney as well. Um, the Lake Nona and medical area, um, some of which is within our boundaries and some is outside of it. And then to zoom in a little bit more into our horseshoe shaped jurisdiction, um, we have our downtown core here in the middle, again, our airport down um, on the south. And then um, over on the other side, Universal Studios as a bit of a placeholder in this kind of horseshoe anchor. Um, and within this space, we have about a tenth of the number of residents that you see in the larger Orange County area. Um, this figure is, I think, a little closer to 290,000 residents at this point as compared to 2.7 million across the greater area. Um, while we are much smaller, uh, we do have a relatively large number of lakes that we take a lot of uh, pride in preserving and protecting, as well as green space across the city and having a nice distribution of community southers, gathering points, and other community resources. And here's a picture of uh, our mayor, Buddy Dyer, and our current city council uh, who helped to support a lot of these decisions being made, particularly as they um, influence different concerns and uh, you know, provide different solutions across each of our commissioner districts. Now, one of the key growing both concerns and challenges, but opportunities in the city, as well as a lot of other metro areas, but particularly the city of Orlando, is the incredible rapid growth we're seeing with about 1,500 people per week in the greater metro area um, is really quite incredible. Um, and we've been obviously tracking and planning for this for some time, but there are a lot of climate related shocks and stressors that are contributing to this growth as well. Um, we saw this after Hurricane Maria when we had a large influx of residents moving to the area um, from Puerto Rico specifically. Um, but with our really diverse local population, we see both um, movement here in advance from in terms of climate migration, as well as sometimes as a reaction to these events. Um, and in terms of providing assets and services, affordable housing, schooling and the like to those individuals when they come. This is something that we know um, is already happening. We're preparing more for over time, but certainly an intersection of um, one of our unique, you know, growing demographics here um, in terms of the population growth that we have. We're consistently in the top five growing MSAs, uh, according to Forbes, uh, just to provide some insight. And then looking even beyond the growth of the residents who live in this area and those who come to learn, work and play in Orlando, we have our tourist uh, population, which of course provides the structure for our local economy. And when you look at a comparison or ratio of the number of um, residents as compared to the number of tourists, it's rather stark. There are about 255 tourists per year for every one resident. Um, who lives in the city of Orlando. And this is also significant when we're thinking about sustainable growth and um, providing the infrastructure that's necessary to be able to support these individuals coming through. Um, we have the largest rental car market in the world. Um, and as these individuals are coming to visit and running cars and they're driving across our roads and contributing towards pollution, both you know, solid waste as well as air pollution as they're passing through our space. And while there's a lot of movement regarding education and opportunities from the moment they touch down at the airport um, to participate in green behaviors, to make sustainability part of their Orlando experience, even having a, sol a number of solar arrays now that um, either have been developed or in development at the airport, really demonstrating our commitment in this space. We have a lot of work to do um, and a lot of opportunities for education as well. One thing I like to think about um, when considering this massive number of individuals who are moving through the area at any given time is what an incredible force multiplier 
that is to influence those individuals during their time while they're here in Central Florida, and then they go back all over the world where they're from. And if they can take something from this experience um, beyond maybe the magic of the guest experience that they have, but something they can apply in their own communities, or if they're in a you know really forward thinking sustainable area, say, okay, Orlando, we see what you're doing there. Um, didn't know you were quite advanced in that way too. That's something we can be really proud of and something we're certainly happy to steward. So what does all of this mean in terms of these goals and this vision, given our community, the size, the growth, um, and our local leadership? Um, it's really rooted in a commitment that Mayor Dyer made in 2007 to become one of the most environmentally sustainable, but also socially inclusive and economically vibrant cities in the Southeast, if not the entire U.S., and uh, there is always debate according to local guidelines of uh, report cards and the like regarding who's number one in the Southeast. Um, we have what we call a co-opetition with Atlanta, um, who's doing a lot of great work in this space as well. Um, we've beat them out in a number of rankings and are very proud of that, um, but we want to continue to advance in that space. And certainly, just like our conversation here tonight, um, be able to share this information that can be replicated, scaled, and grow partners from a regional perspective um, rather than just attain some goal, um, you know, and put that feather in our caps. So across our office, um, we are proud to uh, have a number of awards that we've won over the years, um, grants that we've been able to secure, but really considering this as part of a cyclical process, our work is never really done. Um, it's wonderful to receive recognition for foundational work that we do, but that provides only the base to continue to do even more work. Um, and that's the way that we really like to think about it um, when we're able to obtain some of these really wonderful opportunities, maybe to partner with other cities and we advance, um, advance our work together. I mentioned some of our focus areas earlier, um, but in terms of the structure of our office and how we work, um, we're able to divide our projects into these different areas. So we have a project manager who focuses specifically on solid waste, another who works with livability and local food, um, as well as some of my previous work before becoming assistant director where I really looked at both clean energy and green buildings and transportation, as well as a little bit of water. So just provides a logical structure for how that's managed. Um, and as projects come across our desk or opportunities arise in the pipeline, we know who's gonna take on what. Um, and that's a question sometimes that we get asked. So I like to go ahead and cover that up front. I also have a puppy in the back who has some opinions about what I'm saying. So if you hear um, any rumblings, my apologies for that. And across this work that we've been doing, um, really with a kickoff in 2007, um, but a, a gained traction throughout our plan development in more recent years, we've implemented over a hundred different strategies. And those are policies, programs, initiatives, campaigns, and regulatory measures um, that we've been able to um, been able to pass during this time and engage in. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself for just a moment as I transition to the next slide, have a sip of water and pet my puppy. <laughs> Okay, so looking across these different areas that we have are different pillars of sustainability. Um, we have a number of different issues that we feel we can address concurrently. Um, we certainly can do more than one thing at a time and it's often the best pathway to be able to do that. Um, and one of the areas that we first consider is a green economy or how we can provide jobs based on the sustainability work. How can we continue to advance this mission, diversify our local economy and skill set, and be able to support more of this work that we want to see in the future, whether that's transitioning from other fields or um, looking to, su to support new measures that are emerging. We also have a number of measures that we focus on regarding uh, climate resilience and looking really across the board at um, opportunities there to provide more resilience in terms of our existing, oh, oh pardon me, I'll go back just a moment. Our existing structures, our existing processes, how can we be better prepared for the changing climate, what we know we're going to experience, as well as inclusive opportunities and those that make us better able to provide a sense of social equity across the work that we're doing, knowing many of the financial limitations that our residents, uh, businesses, and even visitors can experience. 
um, as well as uh, that's financial, as well as uh, other disparities that we may see across the board, um, which can include racial disparities um, or other groups that experience either discrimination, certain vulnerabilities or otherwise on the front lines. Um, and considering this information simultaneously, regardless if the program is related to clean energy or it's related to trees um, or transportation access for one. Um, so as to what extent and how best we're able to address these at the same time um, really helps to inform the choices that we make. So looking to, uh, from a planning perspective, I'll be referring back to this uh, graph a few different times just to kind of help us wayfind as we're going through the decision-making process um, and where to begin. Um, so first things, of course, is the planning element of this, um, Captain Planet, and sometimes I joke that that's my boss, Chris Castro, um, because that's what he looks like and acts like to a lot of us. Um, helping to get things planned. So what does it mean to put together a plan? How do we go about that in the city? Um, in our most recent community action plan update, which was in 2017 um, to 2018, we convened a task force and these were local subject matter experts as well as stakeholders in various areas of sustainability across the community. We had academia, labor interest groups, um, those who were uh, forward thinking in terms of technology, um, private consultants and so on and so forth, really a nice representation across the community as well as some community-based organizations as well. Um, we met three times with this task force, initial kickoff, um, picking up where we last left off in our previous plan iteration, um, a midpoint check-in with some ideas that had been generated, and then a final review of the plan before we brought it forward to city council. We also had six different roundtable meetings that were focused on these different pillars of sustainability. So for example, one entire conversation that was based completely on local food with master gardeners, with individuals who are involved in urban agriculture, with our Good Food Central Florida uh, Food Policy Council, um, and so on and so forth. And throughout both these meetings and public meetings, which I'll be discussing on my next slide, we had um, room for open conversation um, a lot of prioritization and moving around different ideas and strategies of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if in the city of Orlando we did X? We took down every idea um, and then ranked them based on whether or not this is something that we have either already begun, something that was attempted but be could, maybe could be revisited, um, items that required additional funding or staffing. Um, sorted them accordingly and then put them on these boards that individuals at in-person meetings when we had those um, were able to vote on with stickers, uh, vote for their favorites and add notes regarding interests or concerns as they go. This is just one example of that, um, but we did these many times over just to really garner a sense of interest um, and add still room for nuance regarding what implementation might look like and those items we should be uh, considerate of. Moving forward with some of these ideas from best practices, not only from other communities, but what we heard from our local subject matter experts and stakeholders was moving forward um, with two different community workshops. We had about 100 participants total, as well as an online survey that was completed by over 1,100 individuals um, regarding their ideas, again, op completely open-ended, as well as ranking, prioritizing, and emphasizing some of the strategies that had already been, um, had been suggested. And from these, we had hundreds of ideas generated and considered, um, and then again, kind of ranked and filed accordingly um, with insight, both from the community as well as internally. Um, but no idea was off the table, as our mayor said, um, unless it was something that was against the law. <laughs> so he was completely open to any idea, whether or not that, you know, was a new technology that hadn't been yet piloted. Um, it was something that seemed very foundational, but maybe we didn't do to begin with or anything in between. Um, and both of those processes led to the development of our sustainability plans. So first, a municipal sustainability operations plan for the city-owned buildings like fire stations and community centers um, across the city. The original plan was developed in 2012. This was updated in 2017. And then this broader community sustainability action plan, um, which was started in 2013 and then updated again in 2018 with a little bit of that process that I just shared insight on. We will be updating these plans once every five years or so. So that's typically our process and monitoring um, all of the work that we've done in between as we go. That other element of not just sustainability, but climate resilience also has plans, um, one of which is currently in development actually. Uh, so first stage for determining 
our needs is really conducting a vulnerability assessment. And this is something we put together in 2017, having a better understanding of where the city stands in terms of vulnerabilities related to climate related events. Um, it's not surprising, we don't have a number of landslides or blizzards in the city of Orlando, but of course tropical cyclones are really at the top of the list, as well as climate migration, drought, wildfires, sinkholes, um, and of course some other vulnerabilities. So getting a better sense of what our historic patterns have been, what the research to date states in terms of what we can expect over the next 50 to 100 years, um, the impact and magnitude of these particular events, as well as a full comprehensive resilience plan as well. I'm gonna go ahead and take another brief pause and I'll be right While she's pausing, I just wanna say that if you wanna make the picture, the screen bigger, there's two vertical white lines, you can slide it over so that the screen she's sharing is larger. Okay, I do have my screen um, fully maximized. Um, but if there's anything else I can do on my end, I'm happy to while we are coming back from my little transition. Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. And thank you again for your patience. Um, I mentioned we have a resilience plan in progress and we're looking to expand that to include not only climate resilience, but how we can bounce back or even bounce forward from other events like a pandemic, um, like cyber attacks, other concerns that we see across the city that aren't necessarily related to climate changes that we're seeing, um, but really a way to collaborate across the city in terms of making a plan for what we know we need to do when things inevitably don't go according to plan. Um, and this is more of an emerging area of sustainability um, and something that a lot of other cities um, are currently developing uh, nascent first time plans versus these sustainability plans that might be going through a few updates at this point. It's an exciting time um, to be involved and also a really developmental time to determine what all goes into this type of a plan and how can we measure for it. So we've talked a little bit about identifying what our particular issues are, how do we determine what we need to do and how we need to do it. Now we need to move forward and make a commitment. And to that end, um, we're certainly very happy to be a, number, uh, a member of a number of different, both uh, national and global commitments. Um, really center of this is the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy um, regarding making goals, making an international commitment to pursue them, and then following internationally developed protocol in order to meet those ends. And some of this starts with just climate reporting and some of our basic G, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reporting, putting together these plans that we have, but more and more we're really seeing um, that this is based on the progress that we need to be making over time and not just committing initially to um, wanting to pursue these goals, but also showing that we're moving the needle over time. Another really inspiring movement that we've seen the last few years um, that thankfully at uh, this juncture as we're pivoting uh, towards re-entering the Paris Climate Accord um, seems a bit of an artifact, but I think is actually quite impressive and um, demonstrative of the importance of grassroots organization is um, not only this global covenant of mayors, um, but this climate mayors initiative that started in the US or we are still in, meaning that at the local government level, that uh, mayors of cities and counties were committing to still do their part to what they needed to complete to be in alignment with the Paris goals. Um, and to date, there are over 400 different city uh, and local government climate mayors representing 70 million Americans who made this commitment, um, even when at the federal level, we were no longer um, in alignment with that agreement. And so it's been so inspiring to be able to be on some of these phone calls that they have to see the movement coming across of what the strength in numbers really looks like. And um, from some classic players in the game, Seattle, New York, Austin, Texas, all the way towards, um, I was on the phone with a mayor of Smithville, Texas, a population less than 2000, um, who had never measured greenhouse gas emissions, had never talked about a sustainability report and really didn't have a particularly supportive environment um, from what he relayed, but knew he needed to do something. 
And by joining this network was a way to get a front row seat to learning from essentially the best of the best and those who are involved. Um, so very exciting to be a part of this the last few years and certainly looking forward to what the next chapter looks like, even with some support at the federal level, what we can do um, representing our jurisdictions and the residents in these areas as the majority of our population lives in cities and what we can continue to do as the boots on the ground in that space. So we've made these commitments, uh, we've made these plans now, what do these goals entail? Um, Greenworks has many dozen goals in our plan, um, but some of those that are top of mind for this particular conversation and a little bit overarching in terms of reducing your carbon footprint at large are recognizing that we need to make drastic reductions on our GHG emissions um, over the next few decades and setting the goal to reduce these emissions by 90% by the year 2040. Um, and in order to reach this goal, some of the other top um, sub strategies or targets that we have are to reduce our electricity consumption across the entire community uh, by a fifth, by 20% by 2040, ensuring that all new construction um, that's completed are green buildings. And then um, also demonstrative of this campaign and iterating as we go um, beyond what's even included in our plans. Our initial goal from our 2013 plan was to achieve a 50% reduction in renewable energy by 2040. Um, and by joining the Sierra Club's uh, Ready for 100 campaign, our mayor, um, like many hundreds of other mayors, committed to uh, pursuing 100% renewable energy. And we jumped from a 50% goal to a 100% goal um, and just pushed back our time frame 10 years. Um, so quite significant. And we knew we had a lot of work to do in making this commitment. Um, and a lot of learning that we needed to experience as well. And so what I'll be sharing with you are some of those initial steps that we were able to discern um, after pursuing some grants following this commitment to explore how we can pursue clean energy and energy reductions to meet our goals. And um, one last quick point, I purposefully left out a lot of charts and graphs in this presentation, um, but what I really wanted to highlight was the impact of electricity and powering our buildings and overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so where we were closer to our baseline in 2010, um, when we were creating some of these plans, um, looking at the darker and lighter gray um, areas of our overall emissions represents the electricity consumption that we have versus blue, which is our transportation sector. And at the very top of this um, orange or kind of marigold color is natural gas. Um, within these sectors, you can see there's very little space in terms of um, methane and nitrous oxide escaping from our landfills, although of course that is a concern as well. But when we're looking at overall emissions reductions, we really focus primarily on buildings and then transportation. So again, uh, given the focus of what I wanted to share. And so essentially what this transition looks like in terms of meeting these goals and bringing this vision to life is moving from the left to the right. Uh, what this is, is uh, the Stanton Energy Center um, over out in the East Orlando area um, and a, what is going to be a coal ash landfill here versus a solar array and community solar farm they've built over what is essentially a, already a coal ash landfill, almost like a grave in a sense. And so I think it's a beautiful symbol, um, certainly something they'll be doing in their transition from um, this coal and natural gas fired plant to moving towards 100% renewables as well. In order to meet that goal, um, there are myriad strategies and a lot of great places to start and to continue. Um, but this word cloud is the product of a brainstorming with a consulting group of essentially what the city of Orlando could be doing to try to meet these goals. Um, there is at this at the words that you're seeing here on the screen very little overlap. These are all unique programs, and it's a lot to start with. It's quite daunting. Um, so this is where we really move from identifying the problem, committing to a solution, but then prioritizing, figuring out what makes sense to start with and what strategies can build on those which already exist. And um, as I think is often a wise practice, it really is most practical, feasible, and impactful to start with the basics um, rather than jumping to solar energy, which um, is often really exciting to talk about. It's really the tip of the pyramid when we're talking about overall emission reductions. What sometimes is less exciting and definitely less tangible is this discussion regarding energy efficiency in our existing buildings. And then even beyond that, those no brainer behaviors that we've all been taught for so long, which is energy con uh, conservation and really recognizing that the cheapest um, and less uh, fewest emitting 
kilowatt hour is the one you never have to use. Um, so it's sometimes easier to shake off those simple behaviors because they seem overly simplistic, um, but in fact, that's really where the bulk of our efforts need to start. Um, and to that end, through some of this analysis, we've conducted about whether or not we can meet our goals in the city of Orlando for renewable energy. We can. Um, will it be affordable? Yes. Um, and are we able to meet it in the time scale we'd like? Also, yes. Um, we were actually quite um, surprised to find that over 60% of our ability to meet that goal would come from energy efficiency alone. Um, so there are certainly some concerns regarding our growing population and needing to meet the needs of our future um, residents and businesses with also committing to this goal, but really I think it demonstrates the value of not using that energy to begin with. Um, so from this point, I'd like to talk about green buildings a little bit and how we've started with some of these lower hanging fruit no-brainer solutions. Um, what I have here is actually a visual of our uh, one of our, our second most energy intensive water reclamation facilities across the city of Orlando. Um, so where all of our gray water across the city goes into these uh, filtration processes, we actually have the most intensive processes um, that a water reclamation or wastewater facility can utilize, um, which is how we're able to then release some of that um, back into the St. John's River. And it has fewer nutrients than water that's upstream from that as well. Um, it does take more energy in order to do that. Um, and across all of our city facilities, our power bill is about $19 million a year. So looking at leading by example, starting with what we're doing, um, following the use of Recovery Act dollars um, several years ago, we hired a full-time energy manager. It is his job to look at this bill and figure out opportunities for us to make improvements across our city spaces. Um, with this, we're able to invest uh, nearly $18 million in a municipal green bond across an initial phase of 55 buildings, those that really needed the most attention um, and could benefit from relatively simple upgrades regarding HVAC units, energy efficiency, um, ductwork repairs, upgrading other features, um, but for the most part, we're lower in terms of complexity, but really um, high in terms of impact across the board. Um, with these efficiency measures, we're seeing about almost a quarter of a reduction in energy use across our entire portfolio. So across the city, we have over 7 million square feet of space. Um, this was only regarding a smaller, maybe third of our city facilities, but across our board, we we're able to see such a drastic reduction, which equates to about 2 million per year that we're then able to roll those savings into future work that we can do as well from the savings experienced as well as the construction of new spaces like uh, the uh, construction of our lead, lead gold certified police station um, that we built just in the last few years um, and that a lot of those construction costs were covered by the savings of these projects we've done across the board. And this is a picture of it here on the bottom left. We also have our Amway Center, one of the first lead gold uh, certified stadiums our fire station one downtown, of course, Orlando City Soccer Stadium and our Dr. Phillips um, Performing Arts Center as well. Um, and these are only the buildings regarding new construction. So what we were just talking about was energy efficiency measures for existing spaces, but certainly setting the bar a little higher when we knew we need to create these uh, additional spaces as well. And um, in terms of prioritizing these particular projects, um, once we've had a sense of what we're able to accomplish with them, where the logical starting place is, um, is really looking at both feasibility and impact. So how difficult would this be for us to do? How feasible would it be um, for us to actually accomplish a given goal? And then what would be the impact at the end of this? So um, in this case, relatively um, low cost measures that had a large impact. Um, I think initial conversations within local government to hire a local energy manager took some time. Um, but once we were able to demonstrate that the returns of paying for this individual salary um, would be recovered many times over with the savings, it made sense. Um, but that's only in terms of local government. Um, when we're looking community wide, there are definitely a number of other concerns and questions that we wanna raise as we go. Um, and to that end, I can expand a little bit further um, and start moving towards that next conversation regarding solar energy in these spaces and not just reducing energy use. Um, we have the Claudia Allen Senior Center, 
uh, that's been a site that's been selected for solar expansion based on uh, the solar irradiance it receives. It's a nice open, open rooftop, no tree canopy coverage. Um, our Englewood Community Center and their existing facility across the city, and then even our OPD uh, department gun range area, which had some great um, open exposed flat roof that was a great site for adding solar capacity to our city portfolio once those spaces had already been maximized in terms of their efficiency. Um, but just like the community, not all of our buildings are ideal candidates for solar. Um, maybe they can't, they don't have the load bearing uh, capacity in order to put solar panels on top of it. Maybe there is tree canopy coverage um, or other concerns in those spaces. Um, and this is really where our partnership with our utility, uh, Orlando Utility Commission comes in handy because as they're expanding that solar array, this is just another picture of what I showed earlier on the collage landfill. Um, we're able to tap into that as a community solar farm, almost like an anchor tenant when you think of when you see department stores in a mall um, that have a really big piece of that footprint. Uh, we have about 50, or 20% rather of the total solar farm dedicated to powering city of Orlando buildings um, that either initially at the time or um, maybe into perpetuity won't be good candidates for on-site solar. So one of those is city hall. We have a dome, uh, dome shaped roof definitely not a good candidate for solar. Um, our parking garage isn't able to support solar panels there as well. Um, the police headquarters, while it has some amazing features, was also not able to integrate solar um, beyond that. And then our fire stations were actually changing over over time. So when we look at the uh, over five megawatts of solar energy procurement across the city, that's not just those on-site solar um, installations, that's also uh, just a bit of a fee that we pay in the place of a fuel tax um, on our energy bill that we receive as a city, um, where we're then supporting that 20% of the solar farm over at Stanton. And both commercial residents as well as commercial, uh, cust uh, commercial customers, as well as local residents in the city of Orlando can do the exact same thing. And that premium is usually less than 5% of an addition on their bill we're looking to uh, try to move and lower that even further. Um, so different pathways, different options that could be available, which really leads us to discuss the strategy type. Um, so providing regulatory measures, which is also often what comes to mind when we think of local government is only one area of opportunity, but unlocking financing mechanisms to make the type of improvements that we've been able to make across the city available for our own residents and business owners is a key port of, uh, portion of that as well programs that we're running are another important element of that. Sometimes just providing information um, or occasionally a new technology as well. One of my favorite examples to discuss is the Solar and Energy Loan Fund, which is a perfect example of inclusive financing opportunities or the city enabling a mechanism that otherwise would not be available um, to residents. So they're able to pursue some of these measures as well. Certainly, if you're looking at your utility bill each month, it's the second highest cost after the cost for rent or a mortgage payment. Um, and often the upfront barriers regarding existing capitals or high interest loans or needing to put improvements on a credit card is a barrier from being able to lower those bills more over time. Um, and it's wonderful if an individual's in the position to be able to move forward and get a solar panel and they've already maximized all their efficiency in their space. But if unfortunately they're staying behind because their energy bills are so high, there's really not an opportunity to get ahead. And that's where the Solar and Energy Loan Fund, one of our local nonprofit partners um, who also operates in the mid larger central Florida area as well, and I believe is involved here locally as well. Um, provides a number of improvements regarding energy efficiency, water efficiency, uh, wind hazard mitigation, and others, as well as, yes, solar panels are one option of that. It's in their name. Um, but what really sets self apart from other financing mechanisms is that they provide low interest loans um, that are available for individuals with either fixed or limited income and low credit scores. They really humanize the financing process. Um, and one of the, I think, most compelling stories is that of Pamela, who's pictured here, who's a breast cancer survivor, and she had been undergoing some costly medical treatments. And unfortunately, due to trying to keep up with the cost of those, um, her credit score had uh, taken a dip and she wasn't able to get approved for financing when she needed to repair a leaky roof. Um, so she had this leaking roof in a room she was sharing with her daughter, making her ongoing medical experience even more painful and uncomfortable, and she got denied several times for financing by different contractors. Um, one contractor associated with SELF, um, part of their vetted uh, administrator group, 
um, found out about this opportunity and was able to repair Pamela's roof within a day of meeting her. And she, like so many other consumers said, I had no idea this type of help was possible. And it was really just a matter of self going through working with contractors and telling me or telling them, uh, give me those individuals you weren't able to secure financing for because they're probably the perfect candidates for this program. And to date, SELF is able to boast a default rate of less than 1% because they work so closely with those they provide service for um, and really walk them step-by-step step through the program so that there's full transparency of um, what's ava available, what the process looks like, the expectations and so on. Um, so we're really happy to be able to work with them. And looking ahead for um, solar programs as well, um, if an individual is able to pursue solar on their home and um, go, you know, a little bit be more direct than trapping into this community solar farm, um, it can still be a little intimidating working with a network of contractors, um, not knowing how much it's going to cost, if you're getting a good deal or not, walking through the process. And so a lot of Orlando residents have taken part in a solar co-op program um, that we've partnered with Sol uh Florida Sun, a solar co-op um, group, including our commissioner, Patty Sheehan, to secure over a megawatt of solar uh, across 95 households in the city of Orlando, um, really working through a joint procurement strategy. So making it easier for the solar contractors who often spend most of their time trying to track down customers and potentially interested customers who don't necessarily have the time or resources to sort through a number of contractors uh, to get the best of both worlds. Convene a group of interested residents who have made no commitment but are interested in pursuing solar and then work together to determine which contractor they want to work with who then gives them a lower bulk purchasing rate. Um, because they have a ready-made group of individuals already there. Um, so really everybody wins in this scenario um, and it's a nice turnkey process from start to finish um, managed by a local nonprofit, Florida Sun, rather than the city. We just help to enable those partnerships and facilitate that conversation. Um, another opportunity for businesses is to take a solar pledge and so for them to pledge on their part to uh, move towards 100% renewable energy, giving them about a decade to do so and making the shift where they then can subscribe. They don't have to worry about any on-cost installation, um, maintenance or repairs. They can subscribe to the solar farm, but make that shift a little bit more over time, um, which makes it easier as well and inclusive. So the burden certainly isn't falling only on our residents. Um, and that gives a little bit of an idea of that foot in the door strategy of building on foundational strategies, knowing that those in our community are starting at different points from one another and that there's not a one size fits all campaign or strategy that's really going to address all of this at once, but that we can do things concurrently, knowing that we have a strong foundation to start. Um, in terms of higher level fruit, there are challenging but also high impact strategies as well. These certainly can't be the first or even sometimes the 10th in line, um, but throughout policy development and expanding that level of understanding of what we're working on, why it's important in making these options affordable um, is the opportunity to provide even more consumer choice. So again, hearkening back to the point that uh, utilities are a second highest expense um, for living or renting a particular space, we know that there has been incredible success with putting miles per gallon on a car or nutritional facts on food. Um, and in following leading cities, or, um, City of Orlando is one of the first 20 cities to pass a building benchmarking ordinance requiring the largest buildings, those 50,000 in square feet and above, to annually um, to not only calculate their energy use, uh, use a one to 100 score where they're given a, a comparison of their building to other similar property types and then making that information available and transparent online. So here's a map again of the city of Orlando, uh, different colored circles represent some of these large buildings and their size represents the amount of energy they consume. So you can zoom into this interactive map and look at different facilities and compare. If you're looking to rent out a, an office space in a large building, a medical office, a, a, a condo or commercial family residence, um, you can compare in these space using a tool that hasn't existed previously. Um, and it really adds a nice level of accountability to these particularly large spaces, the amount of emissions that they're generating, um, and also provides some choice to the consumers and how they want to spend their dollars in terms of efficiency in one space to another. Um, this particular policy took several years to develop. Um, the stakeholder engagement was intensive. Um, the policy passage process was quite challenging. 
um, but we're happy to report we're in our fourth year of policy implementation. Um, it's been going quite well. Our compliance continues to increase each year. We have an incredible snapshot to be able to share with everyone in the city who would be paying these utility bills and certainly those who would be um, experiencing the impacts of air pollution as a result of them. Um, and are looking to uh, potentially expand or further evolve the policy building from there. Um, but so, certainly something we couldn't have done without enabling some of the other elements I shared earlier. Um, while the bulk of my presentation has been on clean energy and green buildings, as I mentioned, I'd be remiss to not also share a little bit regarding our transportation initiatives across the city. Um, we know, of course, that we have this vast rental car market in the city of Orlando, but we want to continue to expand and offer so much more. Um, hence the development, of course, of SunRail. Um, of expanding our bus system and options regarding alternative transportation, um, particularly the 14 out of 16 existing buses that are now um, going to be electric by the end of this year um, on our limo bus rapid circulator in downtown Orlando, which is a uh, quite incredible feat and certainly a part of a larger collaboration, continuing to expand um, both sidewalks, bike paths, um, and trails across the city to make these other options feasible and comfortable for our residents also uh, to make different choices. So we've talked a little bit about how we prioritize and build on these. And then of course, continuing to lead by example. Uh, while I'm coming from the perspective of local government, there's always opportunities for community-based organizations and groups um, just like you all tonight to provide those opportunities to lead by example, to demonstrate interest um, and to be a great starting point for proof of concept or piloting um, as we go as well. Um, one way that we've demonstrated this across our city commitments, not only in our buildings is with our own fleets, looking at fully electrical vehicles, um, hybrid police vehicles. We actually have zero emission, um, completely electric um, police motorcycles, which are great when we have, uh, whether it's protests downtown or a 5K race, we have uh, police motorcycles that can be weaving in throughout the group. No one's breathing in tailpipe emissions. No one's worried about burning their leg on a tailpipe if the police officer is right next to them. Um, and they're actually quite useful in stealth mode as well um, for certain types of situations that they encounter because they make no noise. Uh, you can be standing next to one with a closed bay door as we were in the mechanic shop and it was fully running and it was completely silent. So just really interesting and they have myriad benefits I think that are still being experienced as well as piloting vehicles um, for different use across the city as well. So continuing to explore and look at the uh, cost benefit analysis of these vehicles as we look across more and more um, options for the variety of different uses our city vehicles have from fire trucks to uh, garbage pickup trucks, light duty vehicles and beyond. And in order to support that across the community, um, looking to expand EV charging vehicles for uh, private use vehicles, but on public land. So at our own parks, at our own neighborhood centers and other spaces that the public uses um, to have public charging readily available while also helping to incentivize this shift across the board for purchases. Um, so I talked a little bit about our EV uh, rental car market, um, but for those who are looking to purchase a vehicle here, working with OUC to expand outreach and education, we have currently over 15 dealerships that have been trained regarding EVs so that they'll be able to market those cars, not just for those who are already considering it when they walk through the door, but maybe those who've never purchased an EV before, just getting them behind the wheel. To that same end, we have a number of ride and drive events um, that we've hosted and will continue to host and looking into incentives that would really be impactful to help push those who are on the fence um, towards purchasing an electric vehicle who otherwise might not be able to. Um, and then the last area that I would like to touch on briefly is the other element of carbon reduction or sequestration um, and being mindful of what our trees are able to provide for us. So currently across the city, we have um, about nearly a third of our city space is, uh, has tree uh, canopy coverage. Um, which as a municipality um, is okay, but we're certainly looking to expand that um, and improve not only our air quality, but stormwater mitigation, comfort, safety, and all of the other incredible benefits that tree, trees provide. And to that end, our mayor has established a goal of increased tree canopy coverage up to 40% by 2040. Um, and one way that we've addressed this is through a free tree program made available through Arbor Day, Orlando Utility Commission, um, as well as the city of Orlando using our own funds to provide free trees that are delivered to our residents' doorstep. They can get, um, they're up from one to three gallon in size. We have fruiting trees, flowering trees, understudy trees, uh, full canopy trees. 
Um, and there's a really interesting tool that the Arbor Day Foundation provides where you can actually outline your real property um, using satellite imagery, pick a particular variety of tree, drag and drop it, and it will show you how much you can save on your utility bill year over year. So a really interesting use of data, very turnkey in that it's shipped to your door with instructions for what to do. And we track that data over time and see how it's impacting our canopy coverage. Um, and the last step to really pull everything together and what we're all aiming for to begin with is the ability to put all of this into action. So regardless of any of these of areas that I've discussed as focus areas, buildings and transportation and clean energy, there's always an opportunity for additional environmental education. And that's really made possible through our partnerships, um, working with local schools and their programming. Sometimes it's one-off requests, sometimes we reach out and um, provide an opportunity um, for speaking, sharing or projects. Um, integrating environmental programming across our community centers, collaborating with local groups like uh, Girl Scouts of Citrus, uh, Lego League of Florida, Valencia College, and other organizations who um, may express some interest in a particular program, but we can always move forward um, and expand those opportunities into the future. Um, getting our communities certified as National, uh, National Wildlife Federation Wildlife Habitats um, and really making sure that we have places for wildlife that are moving through um, our community to have for shelter, um, for breeding, for food, for water, um, and so on. And you can do this at the individual yard level, um, neighborhood, or community-wide. And something we've been able, uh, we've been proud to be able to establish community-wide, um, but always looking towards those small uh, contributions towards that as well, little um, nodes at one time in a particular neighborhood communicating this through art, like the migrating, um, mi migrating monarch mural project that we have in downtown Orlando, um, and so much more. Uh, as I said, there's um, many more conversations that we can have, and I hope we do, um, regarding areas I didn't touch on, solid waste, local food, and water that are, are not as directly related to carbon footprint, um, but are certainly incredibly important in terms of sustainability. And looking ahead, I'm really excited about continuing to partner more with, from a regional approach, um, looking at the East Central Florida's Regional Planning Council's Regional Resilience Collaborative. It's a mouthful. We call it the R2C to be easy, um, which of which Lake County is a member as well as the city of Orlando. And we're moving forward with some of these preliminary steps, like we're getting a strong snapshot of understanding what the problem is, that identifying and measurement perspective, um, putting together the first ever regional greenhouse gas emissions reduction that's been completed in any state of which we're aware here in East Central Florida, um, as well as conducting a vulnerability assessment of the region. Um, while we might not be on the coast, some of the threats and stressors we face in Orlando are certainly relevant to our immediate neighbors. Um, and opportunities to move forward and put these assessments and plans into action um, and really um, starting together at the same place, learning from each other um, and having that strength in numbers there. So certainly a lot of room for collaboration um, and great minds coming together. And in closing, um, I know that you all are at the tip of the spear with a lot of this work. And um, I hope that I was able to shed light on a few new um, areas and strategies in our overall process for doing that. Um, but please continue to do what you do and provide support wherever needed. Ask questions, get involved with your local leadership. It's our job to serve you. Um, and it's wonderful when our commissioners get a phone call out of the blue asking about a specific strategy or something that's of note, or we get feedback regarding the, the way that we've been rolling out our EV charging stations, for example, across the city. Um, and really getting involved is the way that all that moves forward. This is the day we passed our commitment to 100% renewable energy with many members of the community and Sierra Club. Other cities that did the same, mayor signing on to this commitment and then our full city council passing it through a resolution, um, really just indicative of the importance of community and moving this type of a commitment forward. Um, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to share all this with you tonight. Thank you so much for your audience, um, your patience with uh, my puppies over here. Um, and I definitely look forward to your questions. So thank you. Brittany, thank you so much. This is Kristen Hughes here. And uh, I've been asked to be somewhat of a moderator and there'll be others that jump in. Um, we do have a list of questions that has emerged as you've spoken through your talk. And if you can get a little more energy and <laughs> have your puppy in proper dutiful pose, <laughs> we, can, we can proceed with some questions. Are you that ready? Sounds great, absolutely. Um, 
And uh, as we get finished with our list here, we'll also open it back up to the audience and ask for anybody to ask any further questions or comments uh, at the end of the questioning. <clears throat> so, um, Steve Hendrickson says, great presentation. Thank you, Brittany. Congratulations, Orlando. And are you supporting any carbon mitigation efforts like applying a fee on carbon? All right, absolutely, great, thanks. Um, and great question, I think this is actually the second question I received on that topic so far. Um, so uh, carbon pricing is certainly something that we've considered in terms of our overall strategy and something that I think was even suggested in our last community planning go round. Um, from an order of operations standpoint of building and fostering a community that's really supportive and understanding regarding our policies and programs. At this point, I think we consider that a little bit further down the road and we're looking to leaders like Portland um, as well as um, Austin um, and some of the work that they've done in considering this in their space. Um, I think with the pandemic, there's been a little bit of a delay in Portland specifically, um, but knowing that those are very progressive communities um, and with, uh, I think, an understanding and support for sustainability that we're still striving for, um, we look to them to essentially lead by example, take note of how their implementation is going, and then as we're conducting our in ongoing planning um, and looking to our next community action plan would certainly be something of note and something I know is going to be um, brought up not only as a suggestion internally and externally, um, but something that we'll want to consider in terms of how right the time may be then and where we are in terms of our impact um, building one strategy on top of each other, essentially, um, if we're at the right place to be able to move forward with something like that. And that may be um, in terms of fostering this culture that I'm mentioning, it could also be as a step, um, sometimes when we do things that are a little bit more disruptive, because we need to advance things more quickly and accelerate them more quickly. Um, so I, um, I hope that my answer helps to provide a little bit more clarity on that and us constantly keeping a finger on the pulse, not only of the quantitative measure um, of where our progress is, is at a given time, but also some of those larger factors. So certainly something of note that we'll con continue to consider. Thank you. And there's gonna be another question later on, but um, just to comment on that, um, what you're talking about with carbon pricing is also a big, two major factors. One is how far out do you wanna stick your neck politically on a national stage, on a topic that generates lots of conversation on both sides of the issue. And secondly, from a purely economic point of view, the carbon pricing market is still very early in its, in its development uh, and the pandemic has disrupted it all. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna create opportunities for uh, advancement, but also it's gonna raise a lot of concerns about um, harming traditional markets and traditional carbon generators uh, as we try to get the economy back up and running. So it's a very complex issue from a political and an economic point of view. Absolutely. Um, well um, so, <laughs> second question. Uh, this is coming from our leader, Jane Hefting in the Social Justice Committee. And she says, um, there are a lot of climate change deniers in Lake County. You may have come across a few of them in Eustis. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to convince denier, climate deniers otherwise I guess both at the public organizational level and also when you run into somebody in the grocery store. Uh, th that's a great question, Jane. And I think in a lot of my psychology background work, um, this was something that came up again and again, which was to what extent do we wanna survey and focus on those individuals who are really difficult to even start having a conversation with and to what extent can you help to move the needle with them over time? Um, versus is that really a good use of our time? Um, and that I think to a large extent, um, focusing on what's relatively a small group of the population um, and trying to convince them in that way might not be the use of, the best use of everyone's uh, time and resources. Um, but there are a lot of other opportunities to shed light on um, some of the benefits of moving this direction regardless, such as job development, such as public health, um, ability to, econom uh, to economically rebound, um, particularly you know, post-pandemic um, with the spaces that we have and a number of benefits that can be shed on improving our buildings now that people are moving back into them and so on and so forth. Um, I think a really interesting case study came about in Georgia 
um, a few years ago with a group who called themselves the Green Tea Party. And they were an interesting intersection of folks who were both very um, economically progressive as well as those that who espouse traditional Tea Party principles um, and really valued being independent um, and being unregulated, um, having a focus on what they could do to control their immediate environment. And I mean, built environment, political environment, as well as natural environment. Um, and for this reason, um, solar power was of real interest to both of these groups and something they helped to expand was the ability to essentially self-generate um, and uh, to work independently that way. There was also a lot of progress that was made using a focus on environmental stewardship and preservation, um, maintaining the purity of our natural world, even if to some extent that's for um, the, you know, the fishing and hunting um, and enjoyment that we as humans are able to uh, receive and, you know, in tandem with that. But I think there's, there's a lot of work being done in that space regarding the language used. Um, and I think that you don't necessarily need to say global warming or climate change to get those points across or to find a shared level of understanding. And while that might be frustrating at times, um, any way that you can kind of have a conversation through the side door where defenses stay down can be much more effective in the long term. Um, and that's how I've usually um, try to approach those things. And when it comes to policy development, really striking a balance and highlighting those concerns as well. Um, I, my particular strategy in those more difficult or contentious conversations is to bring the elephant right to the center of the room and say, is this a concern for you? Yes or no. And then do myth busting based on that um, and try to really highlight the benefits. Um, and I think that's how we're able to find a lot of really productive common ground um, even with groups who otherwise look at an issue really differently. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a tough nut for everybody. Um, so this is a bit like Jeopardy. Um, you don't have to push a button, but are you ready? I'll do my best. How does transitioning to electric vehicles impact or affect the goal to decrease electricity usage? And that's coming from Karen Frank. Thanks, Karen. Um, that's a great question also. And we have a lot of, um, I think, mindfulness and sensitivity towards the idea of moving from a tailpipe to a smokestack um, and that we don't in fact want that to be what our transition looks like. Uh, to that end, the fact that the electric vehicle transformation is now happening rapidly, uh, happening rapidly um, but has been slowly increasing over some time has a bit of a benefit in that we've been transitioning our fuel mix. And it's really been the last few years that we've he heavily accelerated the use of solar in the city of Orlando, both through these partnerships, these co-ops, the technology development and the influence of that on uh, rate payers and so on and so forth. So um, sometimes that can work to our advantage and we're now seeing a cleaner grid and fuel mix than we ever had before. And it's going to be increasing rather exponentially alongside the development of electric vehicles. Um, so in the future, I mentioned some analyses that we conducted after committing to 100% renewable energy um, and the influence of energy efficiency within that. Um, there's actually a bit of a nice tie in between those two trends we're seeing with reduced energy use over time and increased electric vehicles in that some of the um, largest majority of new energy use that we're going to see and potentially energy use overall is going to go towards fueling our electric vehicles versus powering our buildings like they currently do. Um, but in tandem with these emissions reductions um, due to decreased energy use in the buildings and spaces, much more efficient new spaces, retrofitting old spaces, and the introduction of clean energy, um, there's actually going to be, a, like I mentioned, kind of a nice, I wouldn't call it a trade-off, but a tie end where that trend continues to decrease and EVs just make up a larger portion of that even as it's continuing to go down. Um, so pretty fascinating to when you add in all those variables on top of each other. I'm, I'm going to piggyback on this question a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, two things. One, have you got an electric car or bicycle yet? And are you commuting that way to work in Orlando? <laughs> That's fair. This is usually um, the, the first part of my conversation where I add in and I say, if it weren't for my carbon footprint, I was like, I love living in Lake County, even though I, I so much appreciate working in Orlando and living in the city for 10 years. So I've been fortunate to work uh, entirely remotely the entire time that I've been in Lake County up until the last two weeks. 
Um, and now that I am back to driving, I do not currently have an electric vehicle. Um, my last car purchase was when I was still in graduate school. And unfortunately, at the time, the costs were not as low as they are now. Um, but it is something that I'm exploring and certainly would like to um, would like to consider going forward and am, am disappointed that on this side, on the west side, there isn't a sunrail option like there is if I was a little bit um, further east. Oh, so true. do my best to walk the talk <laughs> um, and I'm definitely my worst critic. So thanks for holding me accountable. Um, sure, no problem. I'm, on the right I'm, at the, I'm at the same stage. I've been shopping for electric hybrids for about a year now and I can't pull the trigger because the cost is still so high. Yeah, but it's a little anyway, tricky. The, the mileage is getting up there. It's over 300 now in some models, some of the $60,000 models. Uh, right. um, the other part of this is it, it, this, this begs the question, can a household, by, by putting solar on their own roof or on their own property, generate enough electricity to candle their entire house use and then become a charging station for their own plug-in hybrid uh, so that we're actually not generating any carbon uh, in the in the electricity cycle, um, and the, you know the big game of moving to natural gas and calling it energy uh, efficient or a benefit is is such a misnomer. Uh, but it's only compared to coal that it's really beneficial. Um, so um, I just uh, how does a have people been focusing on individual business and individual household? trade-offs economically on the solar front? At this point, I have um, a, a few handful of, uh, you know, one-off stories that I'd be able to share that I don't know are largely representative of the trends that we're hoping to see here in the city. Since our analyses were more macro, looking at our overall infrastructure um, and distribution grid across the city, as well as solar irradiance, you know, do we have enough space and rooftop as well as ground mounted to be able to meet our goals. Um, I don't have um, a specific answer for you to say how many households would be able to do this exact thing with the vehicles we assume that they're driving now um, and forecasting for a shared economy for shared vehicles in the future and these other options and where our grid is going to be at a moment in time. Um, I don't have that. It is something that we're working towards um, with a number of these uh, different factors and um, models that we're involved with the development of really. Um, but for the most part, when we've seen these um, individual scenarios, the answer is pretty clear. If, if the individual is able to um, to install solar in a way, and I think we're at grid parity now for both residential and commercial, um, where the payoff is about five years or less um, for solar panels, um, and are able to purchase a vehicle and to be able to maximize um, solar generation at their house, given you know any number of factors that you might have of whether or not you'd be a good candidate, that so far what we're seeing is yes, that that shouldn't be an issue, um, but we'll continue to take that case by case and see what other patterns um, may emerge. It's certainly something we're doing across our own city facilities with the uh, grid vehicle, and then also by that, uh, nature vehicle to grid or V to X technology, which is great, um, you know, redundant energy use in the case of storms, especially as we're entering storm season again now. So um, a lot so of much. opportunities. Mm -hmm. I feel a little guilty. We've got an expert PhD here and I'm picking your brain mightily here. So anyway, not at all. No, I, no. I, these are the important questions. I promised Jeopardy. So we have another question from Steve Hendricks. And this is in the, let's see, the category on the Jeopardy board is solid waste. Okay. in Lake County. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Lake County processes waste in all forms through Covanta's waste to energy plant. Do you have any thoughts on that process versus recycling? I'm not familiar with that particular plant. Um, I know that we have participated. I, suspect, I think Covanta is an incinerator, isn't it? I don't know, Steve, are you on? on? Can you answer that question, Stephen? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Can, I can. You, can you fill us in uh, a little Covanta, bit more on that? Yeah, Covanta, it's, it's what's being called waste of energy. And they take waste of all forms, all mixed together, into a plant down here, uh, not far from the villages, actually. And they put it in a big hopper, and they burn it. Now, it, it's 
they would object to being called an incinerator because what they have is a whole series of precipitators uh, that clean up the smoke, if you will. And out comes a small amount of aggregate. And the smoke that comes out of the stack is uh, nitric oxide, which is fairly equivalent to a gas-fired power plant. So, and all of the villages is delivering all of its waste to that same plant and it has taken away its recycling program. And just makes, and it's all mixed, even your yard waste is uh, included. So it's pretty fascinating. And they generate about four megawatts of electricity, as I recall the pitch from that burning. And uh, the limitation on that, they, they get a certain amount of net metering back. And uh, so it's a very interesting process. That is really and, interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, if, Brittany, if you're not familiar with the specific plant and process, maybe that's something you could get interested in and, and follow up with some people. Um, I, I'm also out of a solid waste and public planning background, and we were exploring not incinerators, but waste to energy facilities in upstate New York to actually create just diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, it was very possible and very affordable when gas got to $2.44 a gallon uh, back then, but the project went away because of permitting and federal regulations at the time. Mm -hmm. So apparently there's some folks moving ahead uh, in the villages, ignoring regulation completely and just spitting that smokestack right out the top with some precipitators. <laughs> Who knows? Mm -hmm. I can see how that could be affordable for them. And, as an energy generator. No, no, excuse me, excuse me. This, we just piggyback on what Lake County's doing. And and so I, uh, I'll i send Brittany some uh, briefing information I got, but it's not, uh, it's not, as, it's uh, not ignoring regulations. They have oh, some okay. 12 plants across the I think it's 12, but they have a number of plants across the country. So they aren't ignoring regulations. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't mean to say that. I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. It's not hurting my feelings, but I'm trying to be factual. <laughs> good, good idea. I think that demonstrates really the impact um, and opportunity there with the regional greenhouse gas emissions inventory that we were discussing and um, opportunities to get a better sense of current emissions with the technologies that are being utilized in these different communities. Um, and the reason I hesitated a little bit regarding this particular plant is because there are so many varieties of waste to energy. And we previously utilized the facility over at Reedy Creek by Disney, where they combine their gray water lines and their um, food waste, both pre and post consumer to power a large footprint of their parks and resorts. Um, and because the city does not currently have a facility like that, although it is a conversation we've been having for maybe a decade or more in our water reclamation um, team and what that return would be like and if it would be a, you know, a helpful use of taxpayer dollars given other alternatives that are currently available to build a facility like that. Um, we are using a pre-existing facility, but we've worked with Vista Organics and commercial composting facilities, a number of others. We have not explored something that also integrates um, our recyclables into that as well. Um, but I know there are facilities like that. And there's one in um, Copenhagen actually uh, created by this architect, Jacques Ingalls, um, who has some really fascinating work that he does in terms of uh, biomimicry and really interesting sustainable design. And that's actually designed as a usable ski slope um, and they're in Copenhagen where they don't have snowy mountains, um, but is an option available for residents. I was able to visit it a few years ago after I've been following its development for years was really interesting and it is zero emission. Um, and so I, the only thing that's released uh, apparently is water vapor. And so I don't fully understand um, that particular um, facility and how we could mimic it with something comparable here because it is the first of its kind and they have other completely different emissions factors there um, and infrastructure to be able to support that. Um, and I'm sure political barriers, even if they're generally more progressive in that region as well. And so I always wanna take this, these facilities and the local contributing 
um, you know, population, waste stream, all of that on case by case um, as we develop it. But as there's more light, I look forward to learning more about it and seeing what other solutions exist and um, how good of a fit it may be now or in the future as a bridge. We'll see. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephen. Um, another Jeopardy jump. Um, has any consideration of expanding SunRail beyond the traditional commuter days and hours? The commute window in the region is much greater and the opportunity to expand ridership is exponentially greater than the current service offering. Think of the ratio of residents to tourists. Absolutely. Um, there was always a plan with SunRail to start the line and the development, the hours in which it would operate um, in a relatively limited fashion because it was an expensive um, project and one that was long time in development to begin with. Uh, to achieve a certain level of ridership within those parameters, both physical location and uh, time of operation, and then continue to grow this over time. Um, what's really fascinating about the development of SunRail in an area that is so, you know, single passenger vehicle oriented just by design because the city of Orlando and company regions really boomed post-World War II and we wanted to be a city of the future, not a city of the past where there are these rail systems already built in, which now seems a little ironic, um, but that was the thought at the time, um, is going back and asking individuals to use a rail system when they've gotten used to the comfort of their single passenger vehicle. Um, and, you know, certainly it's, uh, we've had a number of campaigns aimed at how incredible it would be to not be in traffic every day and that you can still put in your headphones and bring your phone and be in your own little space within that. Um, but it's a really big paradigm shift. I think when you're used to something else and maybe even what attracted um, some of these residents to live or work in Orlando um, was not this vision of, you know, um, living like you might do in other cities. Um, and I think with that came a lack of maybe understanding and a difficult way to convey um, the nature of how these public transit systems run. Um, and it was news to me when I joined the city team a few years ago, and we were having similar conversations about expanding the routes and, um, you know, not only bringing it out to the airport, but expanding it to other areas as well and when is it going to run on weekends and we have so many people coming through that at some point it would generate a profit and then we'd be able to afford those expansions and that you know in terms of tapping into taxpayer dollars we had already done our part with the you know foundational development of where it was considered to be most needed um, and in fact what was news is that in every major city New York, Boston included um, their, their transit systems actually lose money every year <laughs> Um, and it's a fundamental service that they provide, but it's certainly not a profit generator. Um, and so I think from that perspective, it's an ongoing conversation um, regarding what thresholds then need to be met and um, to what extent we're going to be able to continue to proceed, knowing that these expenses are going to be incurred into perpetuity to expand it. So that is the plan. Um, that's not you know, stopping any internal planning for that, but in terms of seeking public approvals and sharing that understanding, um, I think it may be a little bit longer of a process um, than was other, otherwise widely understood to begin with. So that is my very long answer to yes, at some point, um, they certainly would like to have it run on weekends um, and for the path to be expanded, um, but that there was planning that predated my involvement with the city um, that is ongoing. And just like our expansion of bike paths across the city um, where we you know, may start with just adding those little white share rows on the road getting a few cyclists who otherwise would like to um, have some shared space on the roads and would be using their bikes to get involved until there's a thicker line and then a green path painted and then temporary barriers and then eventual planters because each of those um, is a rather large investment. Um, and there's a shared model between both the drivers using the road of understanding that bikes are there and cyclists continuing to use that that then demonstrates a signal um, and that changes behavior over time. Um, so, of course, we'd love to have every bike path across the city, um, you know, with uh, semi-pervious pavement and tree canopy coverage and safety um, barriers um, that are also aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, but it, it's actually more impactful and effective to do that in this iterative fashion over time. And the same applies to the SunRail, even beyond the financial model that I mentioned. Thank you very much. And John and Beverly, did you have any follow-up questions to that or any further 
uh, interest in following up on this question? I put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Thank you very much. Appreciate the question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, this is from Jacqueline Arndt. How is Orlando going to try to incorporate the upgrading of existing buildings to green buildings? And you talked about this somewhat in your talk. In what ways do your programs help in creating jobs for those jobs that might be impacted to this transition to green energy? Great question. Thank you. So one of the um, items that I mentioned towards the end when we were discussing kind of that wheel of planning, the challenging but highly impactful policy example um, regarding green buildings is really a great starting point or gateway um, for this continued expansion in regards to existing buildings. Um, and that idea of stepping on the scale or getting a miles per gallon, if you will, for our existing buildings, which provides more insight for building owners and operators, um, actually to the extent where there's between seven and 10% annual savings just through the measure ship, or measurement, there we go, of uh, this process using Energy Star Portfolio Manager or that tool that provides the one to 100 score. So through just basic building operation, it's really um, illuminating an area that otherwise might not be well understood just looking at individual energy bills. And that's the first step. Really beyond that is more accountability um, for tenants in the given space, whether that's residents or businesses um, who are running that space to know how efficient their building is and to make other options. Um, exploring that idea of tan tenant landlord complex um, where an individual tenant might be paying the bills, but overall operating expenses and property value are certainly determined by factors like energy efficiency that do benefit the landlord. Um, and there's a number of green leasing options um, that the city has provided as examples best practices from other cities or those entire green lease libraries um, that we've been part of as um, essentially these working groups, um, providing options like that, making this information more transparent, but also as I alluded to um, next steps with the policy, a lot of cities provide these types of benchmarking and transparency policies as they're called as a starting place for this conversation of how much use, um, how, how efficient and how much energy is a particular building consuming but I share that it's just the buildings that are 50,000 square feet and above. Those are our largest buildings. They represent almost half the square footage of the city of Orlando, but are only represent about four or 5% of the number of buildings in. So small number of buildings with a large impact, but certainly there's an opportunity to expand that to other buildings as well. Um, of course, what we wanna see is incre increase compliance um, in this particular sector that we've already identified before looking to expand, but then also possibly behavioral change, of course, reducing energy use in those spaces, which is currently not in the policy language. This was meant to enable information, not to require a particular uh, performance, but also to provide options for investigating why building performance is the way that it is. So buildings that receive a score below a 50, so again, it's a one to 100 score, 50 is the national average, need to complete either an audit with which both OUC and Duke Energy, which also operates in the city of Orlando, uh, provide free of charge for com commercial services. And they need to do this at least once every five years when their score is lower to have that actionable information with the return on investment and every, uh, re uh, re excuse me, um, return schedule provided and particular updates that they would need to complete within that time. Um, so they have this, they have an actionable report um, and looking to what other cities are currently investigating now, which is sometimes requiring some of those upgrades that need to be made, um, not allowing essentially buildings to be low performers and stay that way forever. However, inevitably um, and invariably, every single city started with what was first just benchmarking, stepping on the scale, making the information available. That's great information for both the operators the tenants or consumers and the city to have to make determinations on what might be next in the evolution of the policy. And those are conversations that we're beginning now and exploring what might that look like for the city. Um, so really starting with enabling information and everything has to build from there. Um, and then hearing from both community organizations, um, local residents, as well as those involved in the real estate community regarding what would make the most sense for Orlando first and um, 
the next, I guess, phase of our journey, if you will, for that. Um, simultaneously, we've enabled a green building incentive program in just the last few months that allows for a tax rebate um, for buildings that are new construction um, that meet at least lead silver standards and above. Um, and so certainly there's opportunities to retrofit um, existing buildings up to these standards. This is really moving towards that new construction goal in particular, um, but also with us providing um, recognition for and opportunities for existing buildings because the majority of buildings that will be here in 100 years are already built um, and doing our best to help them along that journey as well. Um, so that's really an ongoing conversation. Um, again, our job is never done. It's just uh, essentially seeing where we're at in the development, the impact that we're having, and then assessing um, what we can do to provide service and support next. Thank you very much. So it sounds like you're creating lots of new jobs with the programs particularly in the area of HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, lighting, reconstruction and renovation, some insulation and interior building uh, adjustments and rebuilds, and of course, ceiling and roof uh, renovation for the support of all the wonderful solar infrastructure on the roofs. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for teeing me up on that. That is the one element of the question that I um, did not mean to leave out, um, but forgot to incorporate as well. So absolutely, um, working with third party um, impact analyses firms, um, we've conducted policy analyses on um, many of our different strategies, but uh, this particular benchmarking policy in particular, um, and it was estimated that about 600 full-time ongoing jobs would be created by 2030 as a product of this particular policy. And many of those are regarding um, the building controls um, and features of the building as well. Um, we actually partnered with the National Science Foundation and helped to establish um, an electric controls and management technology degree at Valencia College. It's the first of its kind and it's a two year program um, that allows for individuals to go through um, and in two years come out with a often higher paying job um, in any of these particular fields. And certainly in solar as well, um, we have a few different job development initiatives in alignment with um, exploring opportunities to provide uh, jobs to high risk individuals or those who are transitioning from other fields as well um, into this space. It's estimated that for every single solar installation, there are about 15 different types of jobs involved. So only one of those is the boots on the roof, so to speak. Um, but there's certainly um, monitoring, modeling, building, um, and engineering and salespeople, a number of other positions that are relevant for that. Um, and so um, helping to illuminate some of those possibilities, expand um, and lower those barriers of entry um, and help to communicate that is certainly something that's ongoing for us as well. And something that we monitor quite closely in regard to the projects that have been financed through some of the programs like Solar Energy Loan Fund and others that I mentioned. So those are key performance indicators and metrics that we're constantly looking at um, and always asking questions about. Um, it's great to have a one-time installation project, but is this something that is sustainable and something we can expect to grow? And um, you know, for whom might this be an opportunity are questions that we're continually asking. Thank you very much. So I selfishly entered a question myself and I'm next. So rampant land use development is rapidly destroying habitat and water quality throughout the region. Forests and wetlands are simply being denuded and regraded. How can we get the true cost of these impacts included in the base financial formulas for land development? And how do we affect change to the political response to this so-called economic growth? Um, and I will just share that one of the parting comments I got when I left my job as the Director of Planning and Development for Pasco County, which is the fastest growing county in the state of Florida. Uh, the county executive said, just so you know, you know the developers own the elected officials in this county. And that's where we are, I think, in Lake County as well. But how do we start to make changes, real changes, before we lose it all? My wife and I drove out to the villages this afternoon, not to go to the villages, <laughs> but around them, and um, discovered that the about, I don't know, I would guess 10,000 acres has been cleared of all of its forest and wetlands on the road driving up to the turnpike, and from the turnpike all the way up to the villages on the east side. And it is now going to be the villages over the next five years of construction. Uh, nobody's talking about it. And there's big projects coming just east of us here in Lake County 
they're taking out the hills and valleys that are the headwaters of the streams and creeks that run into Little Lake Harris and Lake Harris. And there's a lot of people upset fighting it, but nobody on the political front seems to have any wherewithal. They know what they're doing. They're supposedly providing economic growth and nobody's paying any attention to what's going on with uh, the destruction of our land and our, 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 our habitat and its true economic impact on the, air, on the area not to mention the attractiveness to people. Of course. So right, right. there's a lot in that package, but, but you're the expert. So I thought maybe you had an answer for me. I, I, um, I appreciate this question and it's definitely one that's really close to my heart. Um, I think that the, the best response that I can give is what you initially alluded to regarding true cost. And I um, have said several times, there's a model in development for the various initiatives that we're discussing. And I mean that sincerely. Um, we are fortunate to be on the front lines with a lot of emergent research that's being conducted. Um, and some of it's very fancy artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms with billions of data points. Um, and some of it is a matter of going back and conducting surveys that might not have been completed on our natural land in a few decades um, and helping to facilitate whatever is needed funding capacity or um, political will in order to be able to complete those. And I think that that's really an important baseline and starting place when it comes to um, determining the value of these particular natural lands and their very specific um, benefits that they're providing and that there's not likely going to be one particular discipline that's able to capture all of that, um, whether a biologist or a geologist or an economist for that matter, um, but a combined and multivariate approach that's being used to try to determine all of these if-then scenarios. Um, and there is a lot of great work that's happening currently. I do think there's a lot more that needs to be done and um, sometimes when we talk about our strategies across our Greenworks office, you know, these hundreds of strategies that we have working at the same time, um, when I will try to share this with our stakeholders who have these incredible questions that they're asking, um, and I'd like to provide a more specific response and I'll say, we all are trying to work towards this idea of if we pull the lever, given these particular variables with this place and time or these people involved and this business involved, how much will it help us move the needle? Will it move us forward or back? And currently, to my knowledge, there isn't a comprehensive model that exists quite like that across the work that we're doing, but we're really fortunate to have at least least individual or focus area based models that can give us a better sense of where we oh dear no she just dropped off the damn meeting Val are you still there yes um we Russ, just lost maybe, the meeting I know um maybe we should go ahead and uh let Russ conclude the meeting. We have been going on a very long time. <laughs> we were almost to the end of the list. <laughs> yeah, I know. Let me- who, uh, who stopped it? Was it just a time thing? No, she, her, she disappeared. Can we get her back? I don't know. I mean, she, her, I don't know if her internet collapsed or what. So everybody can hear us and the meeting is still on for the moment. If you could all hang in there for a minute, we're gonna see if we can't get her back on. And then we'll be wrapping up relatively quickly after we have a conclusion uh, with our speaker. I, uh, I don't have a phone number, Jane may, I don't know. Jane, could you make a text to uh, Brittany, please? Sure, I'll do that. I want to thank everybody. It's been an incredible session. Uh, we have a real expert uh, in Brittany and uh, the questions that you all provided across the board are very stimulating and uh, have kept me engaged. So thank you very much. And I think she wants to come back in right now. So I just admitted her. We'll see if she can make it back in here.
Hey everyone, this is Brittany calling back in. My computer just died. I'm so sorry for that in the middle of my explanation there. It's okay, um, welcome back. We, we've you. just been treading water briefly and you're welcome. <laughs> uh, I'll at least wrap up my thought of where I was leaving off, which is really the importance of measurement um, of having a strong understanding regarding um, where we are, where we need to go and the value of those items. And I'm finding that it's more and more important, particularly regarding resilience to focus on what's the cost of not doing something, or in this case, what would be the cost of moving forward with this land development. Um, and I think that it, even in conversations regarding our green building incentive program, what would it cost society for this building not to be green in that sense, if we are gonna be building something, even if it's on a brownfield site. Um, and I think that more and more the, um, the ability to make better informed decisions and maybe even to outweigh some of the, um, the influence currently held by the individuals who wanna develop that space uh, with or without this information, is going to be tipped in terms of the scales for the ability to make decision there when you have compelling objective empirical evidence that um, you know is presented in conversations where that was never an option before. So, um, like I mentioned, it's something that's really close to my heart. It's um, you know sometimes something that is difficult for me as well, but something that I feel really optimistic about in the way that the research um, and the decision making that I've been exposed to is leaning. Thank you. I there are two more questions and I'll, I'm gonna paraphrase one of them quickly and I don't think it'll be a long answer. Uh, one is, do you have any recommendations for online, an online site where individuals can go to calculate their own personal carbon footprint? And most sites that people are, that this person, the questioner, Deborah Shelley has said, most sites don't take into account the number of trees you have already, already have on your property or your acreage. And some of us in Lake County have 20 acres of trees. That sounds wonderful. Deborah. I'd love to be on your property. <laughs> Me too. So any site for uh, going to calculate online your own personal carbon footprint that you could recommend? This would be a dream of mine, certainly the researcher in me. Um, I looked at a lot of the different existing websites. It was maybe three or more years ago now. Um, and I didn't find one that I was entirely satisfied with, I would say, that I think was a great combination of user-friendly um, and counted, accounted for all these different variables, um, was also, you know, was able to be tailored enough and that also utilized science and carbon um, calculations and carbon accounting principles that I also stood by. <laughs> and so um, this is a continued search for me also. Um, I do know that there was a burgeoning concept called a uh, handprint for a while that was focused more on that other element, um, like with trees being able to sequester the carbon and other benefits that you have of maybe things that instead of just adding up what you're doing, which is contributing to carbon, that you're also looking at those things that help to mitigate or avoid. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, but I'm not sure to what extent that's taken off. Um, I would love the idea to provide an option for our residents and businesses where they could kind of step on the scale and enter in some of those factors. And given that there's already technology available, like through the Arbor Day Foundation for that tree placement tool, I don't think it's that far ahead to assume that those principles can be integrated. So um, I'll continue to look into this and share if there's anything great that I find, but the invitation is also open on both directions for that too. I'd love to hear if there's anything I've missed out there. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking at our, our uh, chat group and I've noticed that as while we were uh, in hiatus for a few minutes, uh, a number of other questions have come in. Um, Russ, is it okay if we proceed with those for a little while longer or do we need to shut down shortly? Um, we need to end by nine. Um, okay. That's two that's hours. That's, that's a long time for people to be sitting here, but it's been fascinating. Oh. All right. Well, I think we can wrap up easily with by nine o'clock and I'll, uh, I'll proceed with a couple more of these questions. Um, one of these is coming out as sort of a regional connections question and it kind of piggybacks on what you've been talking about and some of the questions around uh, land use development. Uh, but what, this is on sustainability. One is just, are you aware of um, a resource known as the Center for Climate and, uh, and Environmental Sustainability? which is uh, it's, uh, the president, it happens to be a good friend of mine uh, who used to be the uh, secretary of environment for the state of Maryland, and then ultimately the deputy administrator for EPA under Obama. Um, and it's uh, known as C, the number two ES 
www.ghostbusters.org for a website if anyone wants to go check them out. They appear to be doing everything that you're working on on an international scale. And they're an amazing resource. Uh, so you may already be plugged into them, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware of them. The second part of my connection question is, in the region, are you aware of any effort to consolidate environmental and, and climate action or sustainability organizations to try to create um, a large uh, political uh, block of people who can actually, in targeted ways, impact political decisions around the region in counties and in regional government and state government? So to your first question, I am familiar. Um, I recently have been tapping into the organization as more of a resource with our resilience planning. Um, I have a bit of a repository of different um, individual resources, but also libraries of further information, best practices, frameworks, so that we can line as best we can. Um, thank you for sharing, and I'm looking forward to learning more there. Um, in regards to, thank you, um, a regional approach in terms of advocacy, there is a group um, called we call the First 50 Coalition in the city of Orlando, and they're made up of a really diverse group of both organizations um, and stakeholders who might wear multiple hats. Um, representing different groups, and they're typically um, top of our list in terms of um, putting the feelers out if we're introducing a new strategy that we want to ask about. Um, they often are coming to us first, which is really ideal with their own ideas and suggestions and concerns. Um, and this is an external group. So I mentioned when I was um, covering the plan development that we have a task force that um, is specifically appointed by mayor. They're directly involved in policy development. And I think having that coalition um, serves a number of specific purposes, but also having an informal group like this um, who've really come to us. Uh, League of Women Voters, Sierra Club is in there. Um, a few different groups um, who work in green buildings, for example, are involved in that as well. Um, but really to sound the alarm when something is coming up the pike, uh, to raise concerns if there's something happening at the state level, um, or even just to come out and show support. And so um, while I don't have an exact replication of that that I'm aware of in Lake County specifically, we'd be certainly happy to share notes and make connections um, where something similar could also be created if it doesn't already exist. Um, and I think what's really key is the connection between the in-house staff who are working on these particular matters and these groups, as well as our local um, elected officials and the process behind. Um, and part of the reason I you know, put together the presentation the way that I did, instead of just doing a full um, highlight of all of the best of, is that process, as you know, is very important. And um, there are a lot of times opportunities to get ahead of things or to weigh in at really critical times um, or to be really strategic in the way that um, you know, uh, advocacy is used, I would say. Um, and we are able to provide as much insight into that as possible, but I'm sure it really varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction and at different times. Um, so I think it's most important for the local government members to know from you who are active in the community, who you are, what you're interested in and how you'd like to be involved. And if they don't have something, then arrange that whether formally or informally, and then um, can kind of supply you with what you need to be successful to meet these mutually beneficial goals. But that's huge. Important. Could you share that contact real quick? The first 50? Is there an email or a, or a um, uh, website? It's an individual group of organizations who kind of um, are aligned with the city of Orlando. There isn't a single particular okay. email or group, um, but in individual introductions, um, or there may be someone who's self-appointed, more of a leadership individual um, who Chris would be more familiar with if that's the case than I am of who that might be. Okay, um, we'll contact, we'll talk to Chris, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, well, yep. thank you very much. Um, there's one more question, a uh, couple more discussion threads continued from some of our previous comments, but I think we'll let those go. Um, there's one uh, true new question here. And that is from, again, from John and Beverly, who are still with us. How do roads generate profit compared to transit or other forms of transportation? Uh, toll roads certainly do not cover their costs. That's an interesting and multifaceted question as well. Um, there's, 
there are some differentiations in terms of Florida Department of Transportation and funding that's allocated um, and that we're able to utilize for fuel, um, specifically for gas sales um, for our own roads versus other types of fuel. Um, also the structure, the toll road example um, is a good one of open highways as compared to um, streets that are in boundary within a particular jurisdiction, um, even versus those that are managed like I-4 um, by Florida Department of Transportation and um, not something that's ultimately determined by the city. Um, so there are different- the federal highways. Exactly. Um, and so working with these different groups, um, there are different income sources, there's different outcomes and requirements for how those funds are used. Um, Certainly, I know there are a lot of communities, um, and I've, I've seen a lot of the signs as well um, regarding use of a penny tax for the particular upgrades on those roads, which is interesting. Um, and all of this to say, I think that there is a larger discussion that is happening and needs to continue to happen regarding how do we best incentivize the expansion for transit versus continuing to grow our roads. Um, and um, I like there are many different pathways we could go down regarding transit oriented development and incentives that we have for buildings um, and changing not only uh, the ways that we currently expand roads versus serving other modalities and even parking requirements. Um, the intersection with density bonuses in our um, spaces downtown, um, it, it's a complicated issue. Um, and so what I would say is it's more case by case for my level of understanding and involvement at this point of how we're going to pursue any new either expansion, widening or further development. What type of thoroughway is it? Um, who is going to be using that space and why and how we can, ex um, you know, go ahead and explore other options. Thank you very much. I, that was a lot to put on you at the last minute here. A nice, simple topic question. <laughs> Um, I'm going to thank everybody for their participation tonight. Um, we have a couple more comments, which I'll share. Um, and Kathleen Weaver, thank you for this. She said, thank you to the U Church and to Brittany from the city of Orlando for a very interesting and important discussion of renewable energy and reducing our carbon footprint. So that kind of sums up how I'm feeling right now. Brittany, thank you so much. This has been a really, really terrific night as I'm sure you can see by how many people have hung in here for all the questions at the end. Jane Hefting, thank you so much. And to your team on the Just Social Justice Committee for putting this together. This is, uh, you've been incredible with all the outreach you've done for this entire lecture series. Russ, um, would you like to say a few words to wrap up from the church? Uh, no, Kristen, you just said them all for me. Thank you. I was, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, I was going to thank these people, as I have in uh, all of these presentations, uh, but I also need to thank you, Kristen, for uh, the terrific job you have done for uh, moderating uh, this presentation. Uh, it has been quite a night. It's been a long one. I've been um, gratified at the number of people that have hung in there uh, while, we have, while we've had this, this presentation, but it's an important one, and um, I know that Lake County is, is mightily affected by what's going on in Orlando, um, more so now the Wakaiva Parkway has, has linked us up uh, in a way that has not happened before. Um, so uh, again, I invite you all to follow us uh, on, at our website at www.lakecountyuu.net or to visit us in person at 1235 Mount Homer Road, uh, the, the intersection of uh, 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 David Walker Drive and Mount Homer Road. Uh, we have a beautiful building and we'd love to see you there in person. So uh, I'm going to now extinguish our chalice. And uh, until we meet again, uh, I'll say uh, good night and look forward to seeing some of you again. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Brittany. Great. Thanks all to you, you see folks. <laughs>